<clears throat> well, as you know, we have begun a study into the first epistle of John, <clears throat> which was written in the uh, in the last decade of the very first century. <clears throat> Here we are, not not even seventy years from uh, Christ's uh, return to heaven, <clears throat> and the church is already facing significant challenges. <clears throat> They've faced uh, challenges from persecutions. Uh, <clears throat> They have faced challenges from infiltrations of uh, a false doctrine and uh, a false teaching, and uh, <clears throat> so it's been it's been an ongoing battle <clears throat> right from the first century right up until now. <clears throat> These things have not changed. <clears throat> God's truth continuously faces challenges from falsehood, and <clears throat> so in the in the First century, the, the first challenge they faced was uh, an attack against the very notion of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. Uh, Jewish legalists had come in and had attempted to convince people that you couldn't be saved just uh, based on faith, that you had to have good works too. And, uh, and that challenge has not gone away in, uh, in almost 2,000 years of church history uh, that uh, the church continues to battle the notion, which is so prominent, uh, even among churches that call themselves Christian, uh, <clears throat> that uh, that you can work your way into heaven, that you can be good enough by doing good deeds and taking religious sacraments um, <clears throat> to earn your way into heaven, which is such a total affront <clears throat> to what Christ did on the cross. <clears throat> if we could be good enough, if we could earn our way into heaven with our good deeds, then when God let his son die on the cross, it was a huge tragedy. And you remember what Jesus prayed in the garden that night before he was arrested. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, speaking about his upcoming crucifixion. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he said, Je uh, Jesus said, Father, if it's possible for people to get saved any other way other than through my death, Please let it be that way. <clears throat> and yet he still had to go to the cross because there was and is no other way. <clears throat> so salvation is by grace through <clears throat> faith in Christ alone, <clears throat> adding nothing to achieve salvation. <clears throat> and so that battle has continued and continued and continued century after century for almost 2,000 years, and we still fight that battle today. <clears throat> But the second battle that the church began facing, and the one for which the epistle of John, the first epistle of John was written to combat, was a set of beliefs and ideas and philosophies that had started to enter the church. And it eventually became known as Gnosticism, which is not a word that you very much hear nowadays at all. But the set of beliefs, uh, are still pre prevalent within the church, within supposed Christian churches. Gnosticism. <clears throat> Gnosticism is essentially, it's the, the, the liberal progressive mindset applied to Christianity. <clears throat> it's, the, it's the effort to loosen the definitions of fundamental key components of the Christian church, of the Christian faith, <clears throat> to essentially it, it's, it redefines essential elements of Christianity to make it more inclusive, to make it so that anybody can claim to be a Christian and nobody is supposed to challenge it. It's a redefining of sin so that it's not really quite so sinful anymore. <clears throat> and that, that sin is simply uh, <clears throat> not believing in yourself enough and, and not uh, seeking self-fulfillment <clears throat> And so they redefine sin, they redefine Jesus. The Bible talks about <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> people who followed another Jesus that was not Jesus. In other words, <clears throat> there's not somebody else out there who claims to be Jesus, although there, there's probably dozens of such people. But <clears throat> the Bible's not talking about that. It's talking about the promotion of Jesus Christ as somebody who promoted and taught things that he didn't teach. 
<clears throat> with the wrong emphasis, with the wrong belief system. <clears throat> and uh, that's preaching a different Jesus, <clears throat> saying that he believed things or did things or stood for things or said things or um, <clears throat> uh, preached and taught things that he didn't. <clears throat> Redefining salvation. <clears throat> do, you, do you remember? <clears throat> it was probably... I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, there was for a short time where being born again became fashionable. <clears throat> I mean, people on Hollywood would talk about it and politicians, well, they still always talk about it because they want the evangelical vote. But, <clears throat> but for a few years, being born again became popular. <clears throat> but the kind of born again that these Hollywood actors were often talking about <clears throat> was not... <clears throat> repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it was a born again, quote unquote, experience of becoming spiritual. <clears throat> have, you, have you ever talked to anybody who, who said, well, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. <clears throat> You've heard that nonsense before? I don't want to challenge them. Well, what is that? What exactly does that mean? You say you're spiritual. What does that mean? They don't know. They don't know, but it sounds good. They heard somebody else say it. Oh, and they don't want to say, well, I'm just a heathen sinner and I, and I don't follow God. Well, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. <clears throat> Redefining salvation. Redefining Christian living so that, hey, anything goes. <clears throat> Judge not. You know, when, when you talk about this other Jesus, <clears throat> the only thing apparently that the other Jesus ever preached was, Judge not, lest you also be judged. <clears throat> because about that's the only thing that they talk about for Christian living. Christian living is is seeking the greater good for yourself, <clears throat> of, of achieving your potential, of being all that you can be, <clears throat> of substituting that notion as this is true Christian living. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Christian living is about holiness and about dedicating yourself to God and living your life according to God's principles. Not achieving all that you can achieve in your flesh, but achieving what God wants you to achieve in your life. And so this, this concept of Gnosticism all the way back from the first century is still in Christian churches today. There are quote unquote Christian churches that they're all about that. Now, they don't use the word Gnosticism. You hardly ever hear that. But they are definitely uh, the health and wealth type of churches that it's all about you. And it's all about achieving what you can achieve. And if you give God, give God a dollar, he's going to give you $10. And if you just believe, uh, you can receive whatever it is that you want. So that that set of beliefs which started all the way back in the first century, <clears throat> um, is still around today, and it was the main purpose for John writing his first epistle, <clears throat> to face that head on. He knew it was already infiltrating the church, and <clears throat> so he writes First John, which is, as I've said, a, a polemical type of letter. Uh, it's confrontational. It's argumentative. It utterly condemns any contrary position. <clears throat> Because John had a great love for the truth and a great love for the people of God. <clears throat> and I'm not going to repeat them all again, but I'll just give you a few examples that we've mentioned before of how in your face John was with truth uh, uh, in confronting this. First uh, uh, John chapter 1, verse 6, he says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Just that black and white, just that clear cut of a statement. <clears throat> if you say that you have fellowship with God, but you're walking in darkness, you're walking contrary to holiness, you're a liar. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> Verse 8, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Because that was one of the tenets of this developing Gnosticism of saying, <clears throat> well, there really is no sin. <clears throat> there really is no sin. And the fact is, is that in, in their mind, their teaching was all matter is evil. Only spirit is good. All matter is evil. And so you can't beat it. You can't overcome it. Uh, um, so you can do what you want with your body because there's no way that you can ever, ever overcome it. <clears throat> but your spirit is good. 
So that's the kind of nonsense that he was combating. In verse 10, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us because Christ definitely taught about the reality of sin. <clears throat> and yet there was people in the church saying, well, there really is no sin and you haven't sinned. And uh, uh, if there is such a thing as sin, it's just the fact that you don't accept yourself or love yourself enough. <clears throat> That's the kind of stuff they were dealing with and <clears throat> that John was dealing with. In chapter 2, verse 3, he said, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So <clears throat> when John wrote his first epistle, in dealing with this growing Gnosticism within uh, the church of the first century, <clears throat> they were attacking the fundamentals of, uh, of Christianity, <clears throat> focusing on who was Jesus <clears throat> and what is sin, and what is salvation, and what is righteous living. <clears throat> and so John, when he writes 1 John, is making clear-cut statements about these things, about who Jesus is, and about what sin is, and about what righteous living is, and holiness. <clears throat> and in the process, he's also laying down some crystal clear guidelines of these things will be true about someone who has genuine salvation and not true about somebody who simply claims to be saved. Somebody who is a professing Christian, but not a real Christian. So he's giving us these clear cut statements about these are the truths of, this is the evidence of genuine salvation. If these things are true in a person's life, it's evidence that they are truly saved. If they're not there, then they are not saved regardless of what they say. <clears throat> he said, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. <clears throat> That's an evidence of salvation that he's laying down, saying somebody who is genuinely saved seeks to, to keep God's commandments, seeks to live a holy, righteous life. <clears throat> Whereas the Gnostics were saying, you could do anything you want with your body because all matter is evil. So live any way that you want to live because you can't overcome the evil of matter, but your spirit is still good, <clears throat> whatever that actually means. <clears throat> so that was something that he had to deal with. <clears throat> In chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, <clears throat> John says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot get loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. <clears throat> now, that seems, and it really is, a fairly straightforward and simple uh, statement. <clears throat> uh, he says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, that might seem like, well, you can, you know, this is America. You can practically get anybody to say that they believe that. If they, even if they nominally claim to be a Christian, uh, they're going to say, well, yeah, Jesus is the Christ. Uh, that makes me born again, right? Well, John wrote this in a context of persecution, where to say that Jesus is the Christ could very well mean you are the next one being marched into the Colosseum and fed to the lions or crucified. So saying that Jesus is the Christ was taking a bold statement that could cost you your life. We currently don't live in that culture. It, we already know, if you've read the book of Revelation, that culture is coming again. The day will, will come where saying that you stand for Jesus Christ, that you're a believer in Christ, is going to cost you your head. Now, if you're saved now, you won't be here for it. The rapture will have already happened. But the saints, the people who get saved during the tribulation are going to give their lives for it. <clears throat> to say Jesus is the Christ is born of God. <clears throat> and he also says, everyone that loveth him that begat, everyone that loves God, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So here's this, this other concept, this other proof that somebody is saved, and that is they love other people. Christians. And what we're going to see over and over and over and over throughout the first epistle of John is that the two primary evidences of salvation, which are said in various ways throughout this, but <clears throat> number one, somebody is saved, <clears throat> loves God and his children, and 
Number two, seeks to live a righteous, holy life. And those are the two primary aspects. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak, of somebody who is genuinely saved. <clears throat> in chapter 3, verse number 16, <clears throat> he wrote, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. <clears throat> he's, he's saying, here's what real love is. <clears throat> the love of God. <clears throat> we <clears throat> Hereby perceive we God's love for us because he laid down his life for us. How did Jesus prove his love for us? He died for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In other words, <clears throat> Christians love each other to the point where if it was required of them, they would even lay down their lives for their brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> John learned this from Jesus firsthand. In John's Gospel, in chapter 15, verse 13, he said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. All right? You remember that. You've heard that before. And Jesus said that in the upper room uh, uh, the night that he was arrested. And John says, and we ought to be willing to lay down our lives for the brethren. So John had a great love for his brothers and sisters in Christ and a great commitment to the truth, <clears throat> to the truth. Uh, and verse 17, though, he says, But whoso hath this world's good, <clears throat> and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? <clears throat> so, last time, we mentioned that you've got this fact that the ultimate proof of your love for God is being willing to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, most of us, are never going to have that opportunity. <clears throat> but John points out, well, there's a day-to-day -day application of that that doesn't result in your death. And that is simply this. When other Christians have needs and you have the ability to meet those needs, do you shut up the bowels of compassion towards them? Because if you do, how is the love of God possibly in you? That's what he's saying. The love of God isn't in you. If you see your brother or sister has a need and you have the ability to meet that need, but you won't do it, well, the love of God is not there. You remember what, what Jesus said to Peter after his resurrection? He'd already been resurrected for a while, and Peter and the disciples go a-fishing. And Jesus shows up <clears throat> on the shoreline <clears throat> and they bring in this huge haul of fish <clears throat> and uh, Jesus is, uh, is making lunch for them. And afterwards, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter says, you know I love you, Lord. What does the Lord tell him to do? Feed my sheep. In other words, and he does that three times. He says, you say that you love me, then feed my sheep. In other words, how are you going to prove that you love me? Well, it's very simple. You're going to love my sheep. You're going to love my children. You're going to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. That is an evidence of salvation. Verse 18, he says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And verse 19, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So that's, that's evidence of salvation, a committed love to God's people that is demonstrated, not in tongue, but in deed and in truth. <clears throat> That's what is the reality for proof of genuine salvation. A heartfelt and committed love to God's people, so much so that <clears throat> when they have a need, you want to reach out to them to help them. <clears throat> now, I've, 
I read that First John is a, is a challenging book when it comes to trying to outline it. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because he doesn't really lay out his arguments in a logical outline order. <clears throat> very, very different from Paul. <clears throat> Paul's writings are often presented line upon line upon line upon line, one logical precept after another after another, like a lawyer making an argument in court. <clears throat> but John wrote his epistles more or less like he's talking to family members, because of course he was. <clears throat> and he lays down a set of truths and then cycles through them again, and then again, and then again. Four different times he goes through the same set of truths <clears throat> in his epistle, uh, <clears throat> having kind of a conversational sort of tone uh, <clears throat> with his believe, uh, with his fellow believers in Christ. Uh, so each time he goes through it, he adds a little more, makes it a little wider, makes it a little deeper, but it's the same set of ideas over and over and over and over again. <clears throat> the truth of salvation is loving God, loving his people, and living a righteous, holy life. <clears throat> That's what he says over and over and over. So when, when, when John wrote his epistle, <clears throat> Paul's already been in heaven for probably at least 20 years. John is the last living apostle. He gets the final say, so to speak. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he wrote first his gospel, and then he wrote the epistles, and then finally he wrote the book of Revelation after being banished to the Isle of Patmos, Patmos and <clears throat> receiving that revelation from Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but I think it would be helpful to make a little comparison between the Gospel of John and his epistles. There are some striking similarities, but also um, some very fundamental differences as well. When you read 1 John <clears throat> um, chapter 1, verse 1, it's talking about the word of life. <clears throat> He's saying, I'm going to give you a first-hand eyewitness account of the word of life. <clears throat> And you probably remember, if you've read it a few times, John's gospel begins very similar, very similarly. Uh, the gospel of John begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so his first epistle begins very much like his gospel does. Uh, <clears throat> but the difference is, in the gospel, he is writing primarily to unbelievers and with the purpose of helping them to come to faith in Christ, the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the gospel is written for unbelievers. In fact, in uh, near the end of the gospel in John chapter 20 and verse number 31, he tells why he wrote the gospel. He says, quote, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. <clears throat> so he's saying the whole purpose of this gospel is evangelistic. <clears throat> I would suggest to you <clears throat> that when you have the opportunity to talk to somebody about salvation and they show an interest in it, <clears throat> that you encourage them to read the gospel of John because the very purpose of it was to help people to come to faith in Christ by showing who Jesus is, <clears throat> what he did, what he taught, how he loves people, <clears throat> to inspire faith in Christ for salvation. <clears throat> but with his epistle, it's a little different than that. <clears throat> the gospel was written to the unbeliever to bring the unbeliever to faith in the word. But John's epistle, on the other hand, was actually written to believers. Not to bring them to, the sal to salvation, but to deepen their confidence in the work of Christ and their assurance in the certainty of their salvation. So the gospel, he's bringing people to salvation through Christ. In the epistle, he's speaking to believers to deepen and strengthen their belief in Christ. <clears throat> um, their assurance in the certainty of the salvation that they receive if they're genuine believers. <clears throat> and demonstrating the evidence of salvation. So his desire for the readers of the gospel was that through the record of the life of Jesus Christ, they would come to faith in him. 
and in doing so, of course, receive eternal life. But his desire for the readers of his epistle is that they might truly enjoy the life that they have received, <clears throat> free from error. <clears throat> so the Gospel of John contains signs. <clears throat> uh, in fact, that's a key word in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> is all the signs that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, <clears throat> the Son of God, and God the Son. <clears throat> um, but the epistle, rather than containing signs, it contains tests, tests of your salvation. Uh, the gospel is about bringing you to Christ. The epistle is, was it real? Did you get the real thing? <clears throat> Did you exercise genuine soul-saving faith in Christ? <clears throat> A further distinction between the gospel and the epistles <clears throat> is that the enemies of the truth in the gospel were essentially the unbelieving Jews, <clears throat> the legalists of Judaism who refused to believe that Jesus was God, <clears throat> refused to believe he was the Messiah, refused to abandon their, their legalistic system of self-righteousness based on their own actions. <clears throat> They're the enemies that appear throughout the gospel account. But in John's epistles, the enemies that appear <clears throat> uh, are professing Christians people who claim to be believers uh, and people, but they are people who have been led astray by false teachers. Uh, they too are the enemies of the truth. So we see that the gospel, the, the truth um, uh, has enemies everywhere, both outside the church attacking it and inside the church trying to corrupt it. <clears throat> so John's gospel is evangelistic. But his epistles are what you might say are pastoral. They're seeking to help the genuine believers and make the distinction between those who claim to be Christians and those who are genuinely Christians. <clears throat> so the gospel reaches out <clears throat> with the truth of Christ <clears throat> to those who are not converted. <clears throat> but the epistle is reaching into the church to those who profess Christ. And of course, <clears throat> he's seeking to assist the churches in Asia Minor who who he had oversight of and, and no doubt they were the initial recipients of John's epistles but God preserved them for all of us. So I've mentioned before that, that John had three specific purposes when he wrote uh, uh, First John uh, that relate to Christians. Uh, in chapter 1 verse 4 he said, "In these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So one of the purposes for him writing 1 John was that believers would have full joy, all the joy that Christ intends for them to have. The second purpose was found in chapter 2, verse number 1, where he said, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. So the first purpose was joy, but the second purpose is holiness, that they would live righteous, holy lives. And the third purpose was in chapter 5, and verse number 13, where he says, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So he's speaking of assurance. <clears throat> uh, again, writing to believers that they might have full joy, and that they would have genuine holiness, and that they would have a complete assurance of the salvation that they have received. Um, and so that's the purposes of 1 John. And as you study it, um, it will increase your joy. Uh, and it will give you a greater appreciation and desire to live a holy, righteous life. And it will give you a greater assurance of uh, your salvation if it's real. Uh, or it will convict you uh, if it's not. Um, so the benefits that... Uh, that John is seeking to, to deliver to the reader of his, per, uh, of his epistle <clears throat> gives us some basic keys to seeing those purposes fulfilled. Chapter 3 for a moment. <clears throat> if you're, if you're going to have those purposes fulfilled, there's some essential keys. Verse 23 of chapter 3 says this, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. <clears throat> we need to believe... <clears throat> <clears throat> if we're going to expect the benefit of this uh, epistle, you have to be a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. Not somebody who simply professes it or claims it, but a true believer. And second in verse number 23, he commands us not only to believe, but 
again, to love one another, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. <clears throat> so we're commanded to believe, and we're commanded to love one another. And thirdly, in verse 24, we're commanded to obey, to keep God's commandments. It says, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. For those who believe and love and obey <clears throat> this letter, this epistle, is designed to increase your joy and to increase your holiness and to in increase your assurance. <clears throat> so, and as I've said, <clears throat> this epistle is, is rather polemic. It's, it's confrontational because there was error already getting a foothold in the Christian church. And so John is going to confront it head on, straight on. He's going to um, <clears throat> call out the lies and <clears throat> make them clear. John is writes a positive letter, but not only just positive, he's also negative where he needs to be negative. We're going to look at that next time. <clears throat> so let's have a word of prayer and we'll be finished for today.